There have been several hundred U.S. Senators since that first Congress met in 1789, but only in the smallest handful of cases has the passing of a Senator moved a President of the United States and he of the opposite party to order the American flag lowered to half-staff on the day of that Senator's funeral. Such is the stature and respect afforded our friend Barry Goldwater, a Senator, a presidential candidate, a writer, an explorer, a photographer, a cinematographer, a pilot, an Air Force general, and a man who loved his country, patriotism not worn on his sleeve, but carried in his heart. Hello, I'm Bill McCune. Historian Don Didera says that next to Geronimo, Barry Goldwater is the most famous person to ever come out of Arizona, and that's true. Most people would know him for politics, but politics did not make him what he was. He brought what he was to politics, and we were all better for it. And as we watch this film tonight, we are gathered not to mourn the passing, but to celebrate the life of Barry Goldwater. D during the course of the broadcast and at the end, we'll share some stories and maybe some tears and probably laughs with a group of friends and family who honor us here with their presence. Nobody could have known Barry Goldwater better than his only brother, Bob Goldwater. Thank you for being with us. The Senator's oldest son, who himself served several terms in the United States Congress, Barry Goldwater, Jr. We are extremely honored to have with us the governor of the state of Arizona, Jane D. Hall. Paul Schatt of the Arizona Republic has for 35 years written news stories and editorials that chronicle the Goldwater political movement. And John Shattig, congressman from Arizona, whose late father, Steve Shattig, was a confidant and strategist for much of Barry's political career. Thank you all for being here. And thanks to each of you for spending your evening with us in tribute and remembrance of an extraordinary American man, Barry Goldwater of Arizona. Hello, my name is Bill McCune. If you pick up an American history textbook, you'd read that the losing candidate in the 1964 presidential election was named Barry Goldwater, a conservative Republican senator from Arizona. And it might not say much more, and that would be a shame. For Barry Goldwater's life was exciting and satisfying long before he ever ran for public office. A very secure man, for him, politics was not a way to fulfill some psychological need for power. Rather, it was motivated by a deep love of country, a strong belief in the wisdom of the Constitution of the United States. Politics to him was doing and saying what you thought was right, regardless of the political consequences. We hope you'll enjoy and learn from the telling of his story. And let me add this. For perhaps 50 years, starting in the late 1920s, Goldwater made home movies on 16 millimeter film, sometimes setting up the camera, then getting in front of it. Probably 80% of the old footage you'll see here was shot by Barry Goldwater himself. Now please join us for Barry Goldwater and American Life. Barry Goldwater did not want to run for President of the United States. What Barry Goldwater did want was to persuade a nation to listen to a message. America was drifting away from concepts that had made her the envy of the world. A message of limited government, of the productivity of a free market economy, of the value of self-reliant Americans, the worth and responsibility of the individual. Too simple, too old-fashioned, this guy's a nut, said some critics. Barry Goldwater did not want to run for president. But if the race was to be made, he'd let the chips fall where they may. He shoots from the hip, they said. He has the courage of his convictions, said others, and added, I don't agree with him, but I respect his honesty, his candor. And so they voted and chose a different set of promises. But as years passed and events unfolded abroad and at home, some have concluded that perhaps Barry Goldwater had indeed offered America something special back in 1964, an integrity 
that transcends fleeting political issues. This same president, by viewing the world as little more than precincts and wards, is also turning off lights, lights of leadership, lights of conscience, and lights of honesty, lights of strength, and lights of courage. And these lights need turning on. Not to suggest that candor can't be found in others from time to time, but with Barry Goldwater, it all seems to come so naturally. Well, I happen to think I'm in a pretty tough race. I'm spending uh, the money that I legally can. That's the answer. In fact, it's a stupid question, if you don't mind my saying so. A straightforward style, inherited perhaps from rugged ancestors whose efforts were remembered and appreciated. Any chance that a man gets to serve his country, he's happy in. I'm happy that I have the opportunity to try and contribute something uh, to the country that's been so good to uh, generations of Goldwaters who sneaked into this country from England via Poland. And I just want to help pay for our rent, so to speak, on this land. It's surprising for some to learn that the story begins in the Jewish ghettos of Poland under the repressive control of Tsarist Russia. Born in 1821, Misha Goldwasser was one of 22 children. He learned early that there was no future in a country where Jews could neither own property nor pursue higher education. He fled to Paris, then to London, where he married Sarah Nathan, had two children, and anglicized his name to Michael Goldwater. Then around 1850, he and his brother Joseph joined the dream shared by many and sailed for a place called California. He was to send for the family just as soon as he struck gold. Well, if they didn't strike gold, they did find something better, opportunity. In Sonora, California, they opened a saloon and did pretty well for a while. Sarah and the children arrived, but she chose to live in more civilized San Francisco. The Goldwater brothers' business shifted from wet refreshments to dry goods, as they had both successes and failures in Los Angeles and at such Arizona outposts as La Paz and Ehrenberg, and drove freight wagons through the region. Life in the Sonoran Desert of the 1850s, 60s, and 70s was not refined. You say this was no, this was no rose garden in, in the 60s and 1860s and 70s, and the 80s, you're quite right. And they, they had been literally attacked, the Goldwaters had been attacked by Indians. And, and, and that was a, a part of the, they just took that as a, as a normal thing. I doubt that they'd want to drive down I-17 today, but that, that's, a, that's another risk, you know. But <laughs> there was no water. Both these men later were shot by the Indians. And they finally got to the banks of the Colorado River and there established the Goldwater name in Arizona. And how the devil they did it without federal aid, I'll never know. By the mid-1870s, the business focused on retailing and headquartered in Prescott, the early capital of Arizona Territory. Real success came by offering to frontier customers sophisticated merchandise from the East Coast. Big Mike Goldwater, as he came to be known, had with his wife, Sarah, a total of eight children, whom she raised in San Francisco. When he eventually retired and joined her there, the Arizona business was taken over by their oldest son. Morris Goldwater lived 87 years until 1939, and during the last few decades of his life, had a special relationship with his nephew, Barry. Everything I know about politics, I learned from my uncle, who founded the Democrat Party in the territory of Arizona. Respected and well-liked, Morris Goldwater served as the mayor of Prescott for 27 years, was a member of the legislature, and a delegate to Arizona's Constitutional Convention in 1912. My mother was a Republican, so I turned into a Republican. I never thought of running for office. That didn't enter my mind. I damn near got beat. <laughs> <laughs> it hadn't been for my family voting twice, I'd have... 
At the turn of the 20th century, the town of Phoenix had perhaps 10,000 residents, and it was there that Uncle Morris's youngest brother, Baron, was sent to open a Goldwater store. Locally prominent, always charming, and well-dressed, Baron was a bachelor well into his 40s. 26-year-old Josephine Williams' arrival was a bit less auspicious. Believing she was dying of tuberculosis, she left Nebraska and headed for the Arizona desert by rail. Unfortunately, her ticket and money ran out at Ash Fork, 200 miles north of Phoenix. She got out on the railroad tracks and started giving it the thumb, and a freight train picked her up. Your put mother her, hitchhiked in Hitchhiked on the railroad. <laughs> they put her in the caboose and brought her to Phoenix. Already a trained nurse, Josephine quickly found work in the desert community. Then one day on a shopping trip, she met Baron Goldwater, whom she described as being quite conceited. He undertook a determined courtship, and in 1906, his marriage proposal was accepted. Josephine Williams was an Episcopalian, so the wedding was held at St. Luke's Episcopal Church in Prescott, January 1st, 1907, amid a snowstorm. As to the question of young Josephine Goldwater's life-threatening case of tuberculosis, her oldest son offers this comment for which she would probably scold him if she could. She died about 94 years old, not from tuberculosis, but I think she had a little bit too much of the brown stuff. She had a good time. <laughs> I know that he never felt in his life that he quite paid back for the privilege of being a free man. And my father and my uncles had the same feeling, even though they devoted their lives uh, to this payment. I would just like the privilege and the honor of carrying on for them and carrying on for all of the young people in this country to whom we owe the heritage of freedom. I, I serve on an advisory panel to some uh, UFO out there. I don't know what it is. But, uh, I just, uh, I'd like to see one sometime, <laughs> sober. <laughs> I don't say let's go back to anything. I want to go forward with the proven values of the Constitution. I want to go forward with the proven values of an economic system we call profit or capitalistic or free, whatever you want to name it. I want to see this country really move. I don't want to see unemployed people unemployed because of the stupidity of a government that's afraid to go ahead. He, he talked so fast, you know, and I said, I said, you know, Hubert sitting there trying to listen to you, to you reminds me of trying to read uh, Playboy magazine with my wife turning the pages. <laughs> extent that life could be genteel in Frontier Phoenix, it might have been for the Goldwaters. A nice home on Central Avenue, a comfortable income, an active social life, and exactly two years from their wedding, January 1st, 1909, the birth of their first son, christened Barry Morris Goldwater. Fifteen months later, on the 4th of July, came a second son, Bob. The next year, a daughter, Carolyn, was born on the same day as the sinking of the Titanic. Their father's attention was clearly focused on the family business, which prospered as Arizona grew. His recreation focused on friendly card games and cocktails with a cadre of pals, a practice undisturbed by prohibition. Oh, sure. Nobody paid much attention to it. Uh, I wasn't too old to make beer, so I made beer for my father, but I don't think it was any good. And I can remember the bootleggers used to gather out under the Central Avenue Bridge. It was Josephine Goldwater who proved to be the more adventuresome parent. Weekends and holidays found her and her brood camping and exploring the far reaches of Arizona's deserts and mountains. She was also an excellent golfer who won local tournaments and taught the game to her kids. And it is reported she was a highly skilled marksman who slept with a pistol under her pillow. One story goes that on the 4th of July, 1918, nine-year-old Barry found that six-shooter under his mother's pillow and fired off a few shots in celebration, destroying a full barrel of his father's whiskey. While others enjoyed the day's picnic, young Master Goldwater got to sit and watch the slow-moving hands of a grandfather clock 
for 16 hours. The Goldwater home was the place where boyhood pals hung around. We would drive, get on a bicycle and hide someplace to play a game or something. And we thought we were athletes. We had sweaters and all that sort of thing. <laughs> but Barry was always able to figure out something. Harry Rosenzweig was later the state's Republican Party chairman. This will be a nomination for Senator Goldwater of Arizona. Mr. Chairman. Schoolmate Paul Fannin became Arizona's governor and served with Goldwater in the United States Senate. In those days before air conditioning, summers were often spent in the mile-high city of Prescott, the home of one of America's oldest annual rodeos. There, Barry Goldwater became a lifelong friend, which much later included some Air Force duty with young Budge Ruffner, who was 10 years his junior. It was summer, it was hot, and he'd been flying that out of uniform, so to speak, and he forgot that he didn't have his pants on, climbed out of that aircraft in Nellis Air Force Base that summer morning, and the officer of the day met him, requested that he return to the aircraft and put on his pants. <laughs> I'm seeking the uh, presidency of the United States because I feel that all of us owe something for our lives in this country. I think we owe a little bit of rent, you might call it, for the privilege of being an American. And while I serve... Appreciating the privilege of being an American was a message reinforced by Josephine Goldwater and by the newness of Arizona statehood, coming when Barry was only three years old. Well, the funny thing is, I, I can remember statehood, Jay. Can you? Uh, about all I can remember about it, there was a lot of people out. Uh, but the biggest memory I had was my mother taking our flag down, which she, she flew it every day, and she put two new stars in the flag. And I've lost that damn thing. I wish I still had it. But perhaps the most significant long-term influence was the family requirement of absolute honesty. Bob Goldwater. So if we told him the truth, why, there wasn't any punishment involved, but we were always taught that the worst thing we could do would be to lie. And uh, today, Barry, uh, well, he's, he's still mad at Nixon, mainly because Nixon lied. To him, that was the ultimate sin. And it sort of stuck. In any community, business success can place certain families in prominent civic and social standings. And in Phoenix of the 1920s, the Goldwaters enjoyed such a position. He, he, he crossed barriers, ethnic and racial barriers, with, with great panache and great ease. He had no difficulty at all. And of course, you know, he's bilingual. And, uh, and he was bilingual, and competently so, before it became uh, either fashionable or, or necessary to be so. If the interests and activities of young Barry were anything but stuffy, there were perhaps times when he got a bit too cocky, as during a lesson from a professional boxer. So he said, well, come on up in the ring and we'll, we'll teach you something. So I made the big mistake of hitting that guy. <laughs> he just kicked the living hell out of me. And he said, don't ever hit a professional. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> A relatively new phenomenon of the day was called radio, and Barry Goldwater was, in a sense, Arizona's first disc jockey. When it first went on the air, it was an amateur radio station. I was an amateur radio operator, and we used to play phonograph music, and uh, I think one night we got heard in Mesa, <laughs> and, and I just sat there changing the records. Yeah. You didn't tell jokes or things like no, that? No, I didn't do that in those days. You've always had an interest in radio ever since. You have quite a ham yeah. uh, operation. During the Vietnam War, I understand you made your, uh, uh, your ham system available so that servicemen in Southeast Asia yeah. could talk to their families. We did about 300,000 phone patches. 
during that war. And we had about 24 or five people who came up here and ran the station, sometimes all night. No, we just used there. the first name. He just knows that the fellow's name's Barry. Baker, Abel, Roger, Roger, Yankee. That's and it. I hear, I have to, of course, I have to listen to it. And uh, some of these things you hear would, uh, uh, it makes tears come to your eyes. Well, he had more to say than anybody else. He was a better talker. He always had something to say. In 1923, Phoenix Union High School provided Barry a wealth of activity. He was elected freshman class president. He played football and basketball. But the local high school career was short-lived. But at the end of my freshman year, the superintendent told my father that he didn't want me back in the high school. I don't know what I did wrong, but I did something. So they sent me to the Stanton Military Academy in Virginia. The years at Stanton would shape Goldwater's outlook and mold his life. From a first-year cadet who was usually in trouble, he grew in discipline and in purpose. In his fourth year, 1928, he won the Outstanding Cadet Award and was offered an appointment to the United States Military Academy at West Point. Much of this personal growth he credits to the influence of regular Army Major Alexander M. Patch, who was then assigned to Stanton. Later, as a general in World War II, Sandy Patch would replace George Patton as commander of the Seventh Army. He influenced me in, in knowing how to keep my mouth shut and to uh, listen to what others had to say and to respect the uh, opinions of my elders. And he taught me discipline. Goldwater enrolled at the University of Arizona at Tucson. That he did not go to West Point was a decision he always regretted. But his father's health was poor, and Josephine thought it better to have Barry near home. He jumped into campus life, he pledged Sigma Chi fraternity, was elected freshman class president, played varsity football, he was the center, and made the basketball team. His curriculum was business administration, and his avocation was the enjoyment of college life. For many Americans, 1929 was a watershed year. For the Goldwaters, it began with tragedy. On March 5th, Baron Goldwater suffered a heart attack and died. The family decided that Bob Goldwater should get an education. He attended the University of Illinois, then graduated from Stanford. Sister Carolyn would attend UCLA. Barry would leave the University of Arizona to learn the family business. I, I believe that it was an opportunity for him to get out and, and go to work. And, and, and Barry really enjoyed merchandising. As it turned out, I don't know that he knew that he did then, but, but he became a good merchant. He, he was very style conscious. The Great Depression provided difficult times for business. Some competitors went under. The Goldwater stores in Phoenix and Prescott held on. I remember when I was running the business back in the 1930 Depression, uh, we went five years, never made money, Never had to fire anybody. The late 20s and early 30s would bring certain hobbies, interests, and avocations, which thereafter would always be part of Barry Goldwater's life. He said, climb in, see how, you, how it feels. And I got in. He got in. and He started the thing up, and I said, what are you doing? Well, he says, nothing. We'll taxi out here a little ways. Well, the first thing I knew, he was taking that plane up off the ground, and there I was, just, <laughs> I didn't know what to do. I didn't know he could fly. So he really hung one on me that day. Scare you? Well, of course it scared me. <laughs> I'd go out about 5 o'clock in the morning and fly, but in those days, you only need 10 hours to uh, solo, and if you were pretty good, they'd give you a license. <laughs> Simple as that. So uh, that's the way I got in it. That's been 65, so it was 65 years ago. A 
Of course, the most lasting event of Barry Goldwater's life occurred in 1930, when he met Margaret Johnson of Muncie, Indiana, whose family wintered in Phoenix. They attended some of the same parties and outings, but it's said that Peggy didn't seem much interested in him at first. An aspiring clothing designer, Peggy spent the next few years studying, working, and vacationing in New York, Indiana, Michigan, and Arizona. Barry pursued her and proposed marriage several times. Peggy first wanted to promise that he would stop flying and take up bridge. Of course, he lied. Finally, on New Year's Eve, 1933, she said yes. The wedding was held September 22, 1934, at Grace Episcopal Church in Muncie, Indiana. Oh, everybody loved her. We figured it was the best thing that could happen to Barry. People in everything in my life, we were married 52 years. She was the mother of my children. And when I was away at war, she taught the children the things that I would have taught them. No. It's just a wonderful life. Sometimes the world was on our side. Sometimes it wasn't fair. Sometimes it gave a helping hand. Sometimes we didn't care. Cause when we were together, we made the dream come true. If I had only one friend left, want it to be you. Someone who understands me and knows me inside out and helps keep me together and believes without a doubt that I could move a mountain someone to tell it to if I had only one friend left I'd want it to be Barry, we just saw a segment profiling the, the family life there at the end, tribute to, to your mother. What was, what was it like uh, being Barry Goldwater's son? What was, what was family life like? Family life, um, I mean, it was pretty normal. Nothing really outstanding other than the fact that uh, we were a very active family. Uh, we'd go on camping trips all the time. My mother and dad would take us different places. Um, you know, I, I remember my mother and dad, he said they were going to marry some 50 years, and, and I know they were in love. But I think the tragedy of my father's service to his country was the fact that they weren't together very often. And in fact, uh, I think my mother had as much, if not more, influence on the kids growing up because dad was either at war or in the Senate or doing something for his country. And mother was st would be staying home with us. She was a, a grand lady, uh, sensitive, warm, caring. I think that was a tragedy of their marriage, was the fact that they really weren't together that much. 
Uh, but I guess when they got together, they had fun. They, they did things together. Looks like it. Looks like it. Bob Goldwater, I, I, I asked somebody one time, uh, how does how does Bob Goldwater deal with his brother being this you know this famous guy? Does he feel like he's in his brother's shadow? And that their answer was, Bob Goldwater is the most self self assured person that uh, that they ever knew. What was it like being Barry Goldwater's brother? Well, I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> I got a a lot more out of what Barry was than it ever hurt me. In fact, I don't think it hurt me a lick. I enjoyed it. <laughs> I was very proud of it. You know, maybe it's just the way, you know, uh, genetics or something, but, uh, you know, he went off into politics and, and you didn't. Or did you ever have any interest in pursuing that? Or was that just his ball? I think I was probably a little too thin-skinned to go into politics. Mm -hmm. uh, Barry used to worry about it. Once in a while, he'd, he'd call me and he'd... Uh, Say, now, I'm, I'm going to say this or something, and I'm going to get hell for it. I just want you to be prepared for it. It isn't going to bother me, so I don't want it to bother you. Governor Hall, comment your memories of Barry Goldwater? Let me go to something that Bob just said about thin-skinned and thick-skinned. I think it's nice he called you when he was going to say something, because I've always found in politics, it's not what to say about me, the candidate, uh, it's what they say ab about me that hurts the family. Mm. And I, I think that's something that uh, I'm glad I would have thought Barry would have been very kind and uh, warned everybody that uh, yeah. something was going to be said. I think that's another true mark of the person. Good. John? I, I think Barry Jr.'s comment about the incredible sacrifice that uh, the family made and the time that Barry and Peggy had to be apart, uh, I think that's a very telling point because I think in those days the commute to Washington was long and Barry. Mm. Uh, had lots of demands on his time. I guess uh, the story, Bob, about you is, and uh, I, I assume it's true, is that when uh, Barry was nominated in 1964, Munn, I guess, was not there. She was back in the hotel room, and they told her that Barry had just been nominated, and she turned and said, they got the wrong one. Bob's smarter. <laughs> <laughs> That's in the show. That comes up a little <laughs> later in the documentary, actually. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, on ABC. You know, uh, Governor Hall, uh, I remember when I was growing up with my dad, he said, uh, you know, he would say, be careful what you say because we got the same name. <laughs> and I said, and I, I told him, I said, what do you mean, me? You should be careful. I said, every time you say something that's outrageous, they call me and ask me to explain what you just said. So it's, uh, Paul Shatt, you've... Uh we're not really so much into the political segment of the show yet, but, but you've uh, certainly covered and known Barry Goldwater for a long time. What are your memories? Well, yeah, I think the, uh, the, the most interesting facet about Barry Goldwater was uh, he was the quintessential straight-talking man from the West. I mean, forget about John Wayne. This was the real article. And uh, even, you know, in, in the, uh, near the end of his life, he would go to ASU and speak to college students, and they're not used to hearing a politician speak in straight terms. And so he would blow them away sometimes. I remember one time he, he was supposed to speak about women in politics. I don't know if you remember this. Uh, and he said, I'll tell you about women in politics. Rose Mofford ought to be governor and Ev Meekham ought to quit. <laughs> <laughs> Jane, did you have, or excuse me, Governor Hall, did you have much contact with Barry over the years? I, I, I think you lived in the same legislative district, didn't you? Uh, no, 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 no. He was always uh, in the, the adjoining district. Uh, we had contact. He had, uh, you know, he was obviously much am admired. The uh, one of the fondest memories I have was shortly after he came back from the Senate. There was a an honoring day for Barry Goldwater. He came down to the House and the Senate. Um, Senator Estane and I, I believe, uh, muscled each other out of the pictures to see who was going to have their picture closest to Barry Goldwater. And I still have one that I think was the closest. Uh, but it was a whole day honoring him. Down at the legislature. I'll tell you, in a general sense, my one of my memories of him, and I and I think Bob, I think you make reference to this in the documentary. He was he was the best dressed politician that I have ever seen, and he wore clothes well, whatever that means. He just could make a suit look great. Well, you know, he was uh, for several years he was on the ten best dressed men's list, and it used to make all of his friends out here. We, 
Uh, we laughed like hell about that because he, he'd show up sometimes in the worst outfits. You, you, you'd think he spent all night trying how to figure out how to dress so poorly. Great. And one time when he came out to play golf with Sam Sneed in a pro-am, Sneed just looked at him and shook his head. And, and that's a long story that well, I'll That picture tell. of what Barry was wearing playing with Sam Sneed is coming up a little bit later in the show. But now uh, let's go back to Barry Goldwater and American Life. I started with an old four by five draft mix. And the hood was up, it was about that tall, about that wide. So I just wandered around the state taking pictures. I gave about 10,000 negatives to the University of Arizona this last year. Since the 1930s, Barry Goldwater's photographs, particularly those of Native Americans and of the Southwest, have been exhibited throughout the world. Several books of the work have been published. He's a member of the Royal Photographic Society of London. The pre-war period was a time for exploring the wide expanses of Arizona by plane, by car, and on foot. Equipped with a motion picture camera, he shot tens of thousands of feet of 16 millimeter film, often capturing views and experiences never before recorded. One such was a 42-day raft trip covering the entire length of Arizona's Colorado River in 1940. Well, it was a wonderful experience. It still is. Uh, I was the 70th person that ever went through the whole river system. Now about 16,000 a year. Not through the whole system, but they go through parts of the Grand Canyon and all of the Grand Canyon. With the later construction of Glen Canyon Dam creating Lake Powell, some of these canyons now lay under 300 feet of water. Another involvement was aimed at helping to promote interest in Native American culture. These Indian ceremonials Goldwater captured on film in the late 1940s. But years earlier, he was a member of the Smokeye People, an organization of Anglos in Prescott, Arizona, which annually, for more than 60 years, costumed themselves in the dress of specific tribes and performed traditional dances. Membership is denoted by the small tattoo on the left hand. And there was always some time for the golf course. Oh, Did you win the Phoenix Open at one time? I won, I won two of the pro amateurs. Then I won one with Sam Snead. Look, you could win anything with Sam Snead. <laughs> but I, I was never the golfer my brother was. I, I had a three handicap, and he was zero. Music held some kind of interest. Yeah, I played the mandolin, and I taught myself how to play the saxophone and clarinet, but never too good. I, have a, I play an instrument that I was going to suggest that I bring down. What? what? Well, I call it a thumper. Oh, I know. And I got it from Bill's Gay Nighties many years ago. Yeah. I haven't played it lately because the neighbor below doesn't appreciate that <laughs> level of artistry, but... It might surprise some to learn that Barry Goldwater had a doll collection. Of course, this is a Kachina doll, a representation of a spirit in the life and religion of the Hopi people of northern Arizona. He began collecting them as a teenager, sometimes bartering his more urban possessions. As an adult, he purchased numerous others. Eventually, the collection numbered some 700 dolls, which may be seen today, as he donated them to the Heard Museum of Native American Anthropology and Art in Phoenix.
The early years of Barry and Peggy's marriage reflected a young couple in love and enjoying each other's company, as well as outings with friends. But it was time to establish a family home, and on the northern outskirts of town, they bought a large lot and built a spacious two-story house featuring the latest in Art Deco designs and materials. They moved in in February 1936, just a couple of weeks after the birth of their first daughter, Joanne, on January the 18th. In time, three more children would follow. Barry Jr. in July 1938, Michael in March of 1940, and Peggy in July, 1944. Life for the Goldwaters might have continued in a certain free-spirited fashion had it not been for dramatic world events. In 1930, shortly after graduating from Staten Military Academy, Barry had joined the Army Reserve. He was commissioned a second lieutenant and had drilled regularly with the 25th Infantry Division in southwestern Arizona. By 1940, it seemed obvious that America would soon find itself involved in the war in Europe. Reserve Lieutenant Goldwater hoped to transfer to the Army Air Corps and into the cockpit. But at age 30, he was considered too old, over the hill, and with three kids already, unsuited for flying military combat planes. That is until 1941, when he paid a visit to nearby Luke Field. Just before the Pearl Harbor, well, in fact, the summer before, I went out to Luke Air Force Base to see what I could do to help them. And the commander was sitting there in terrible shape, and I made the mistake of saying, you know, you're in bad shape out here. You need some help. Yeah. So I was, I was on duty, and I thought, that'll be good. It only lasts six months. Five years later, I got out of the damn army. <laughs> Several times, his request for fighter plane training was refused, so Goldwater developed an effective, if not illegal, plan. He would provide a photographic portfolio, or movies, for each flight instructor, buy their plane in the cockpit, in the air, suitable for framing and perfect for the folks back home. In return, the determined lieutenant would receive behind-the-stick time in the AT-6 trainer. He logged more than 200 hours of such unofficial training and ultimately qualified without the benefit of ever having been a cadet. When the war came, now Captain Goldwater was sent to open a new Air Force training school in Yuma, Arizona. The next year, he transferred to the Military Air Transport Service as chief pilot for the Far Eastern Theater. Well, I was in the ferrying command, and I flew damn near everything. B-17s, B-24s, B-47s, 46s, I and mean, then all the fighters. They kept me busy. Uh, Ed uh, was a flyer in the... Uh, yes, the Marine sketch Corps. was... He and I were in the ferry command, and don't misinterpret. <laughs> Based in Karachi, India, which is now part of Pakistan, the unit transported fighters, bombers, and supply planes throughout China, India, and Burma, occasionally taking some leave time with his buddies and shooting a bit of film.
Ultimately, he flew in every theater of operations except the Pacific and returned to the States a lieutenant colonel in 1944. Goldwater may have been back in civilian clothes, but he didn't stop flying missions, rescue flights for Mexican flood victims, emergency food to snowbound Navajos, and missions at the Los Angeles airport during the Korean War. And then a voice came over the loudspeaker and said, any men in uniform wanting a ride to Arizona, go to runway such and such. And they went down there. There was a fellow named Barry Goldwater sitting in his plane. Every day in those weeks before Christmas, all day long, he'd load up the plane, fly it to Arizona, fly them to their homes, fly back over to get another load. With World War II at an end, the Goldwater family could get back to normal. Business was booming in Phoenix as thousands of veterans moved to warm, dry Arizona, where they had trained during the war. For the kids, there was time for fun. For Barry and Peggy, there would be time for entertaining and for vacations away. And for Barry, there would be time again for exploring the canyons and mesas, toting his cameras, capturing the nooks and crannies and moods of Arizona and sharing those images through frequent presentations in schoolrooms and to civic clubs. For Barry Goldwater, there was not yet any thought of politics, but in the late 1940s, a state commission on the Colorado River was to be appointed to try to settle the Arizona-California dispute over water. Barry was recruited to serve, and he did. And whether he knew it or not, the drift into public service had begun. I will offer a choice, not an echo. This will not be an engagement of personalities. It will be an engagement of principle. Well, we got a best audience we've had in here in a long time, Barry. This is the best show you've had in a long time. Up here. <laughs> um, Art Buckwald said the way to, to settle this is if Barry says that the missiles aren't accurate, put Barry in a rowboat in the middle of the ocean and fire a missile at him. I want to go ahead in the 20th century, in the 21st century, under the goodness of our Constitution and our free enterprise system and the initiative of American people. I don't like to see us become a nation of mollycoddled people depending upon a central government for everything, most of which, by far, we can do better ourselves. Remember the first time you ever piloted a jet? Yes, I do. It was up at uh, in Northern California with the California National Guard. It was an F-80. It was in the summer of 46, I think. <laughs> Early jet. Yeah, I took it up. What do you think? Well, I just thought, by God, this is the way to travel. <laughs> In 1946, Barry Goldwater was asked to organize Arizona's first Air National Guard unit, the 197th Fighter Squadron. He gladly traded his wartime rank of lieutenant colonel to be a peacetime captain. In accepting the command, however, he insisted that the unit be racially integrated, something that had not been the common practice. Over the years, he continued to serve, later with the 99-99th Air Force Reserve Squadron training and studying, flying virtually every jet in the American arsenal, finally retiring with two stars, the rank of Major General. In 1986, the Congress vigorously debated the procurement of a new Air Force jet. Convince this body that the plane couldn't even fly. Oh, now you come to the floor and head. you say, and you say, I'll read the record. I'll read the I never said that airplane wouldn't fly. You the said senators. you wouldn't fly it yourself. I flew it. You said you wouldn't, so before I you did. I flew it. Senator Goldwater had gone out and tested the plane himself at the age of 77. That old barnstormer, you'll recall, who back at age 30 was said to be too old to fly. Meanwhile, back in 1949, there was a reform movement aiming at the Phoenix City Hall. 
40-year-old Goldwater and best friend Harry Rosenzweig were interested only in helping behind the scenes. Rosie and I were the committee to get candidates to run for the city council. And the day before they were to all to be filed, he called me and he said, uh, we're short too. Well, I said, pick anybody. He says, I have, you and me. The charter government ticket won every precinct, and Barry Goldwater came in first. So the group put this charter government ticket together, and we won. And I thought, well, I'll spend a couple of years doing this, and then I can go back to running the business. It's particularly fun to read certain excerpts from the letter he wrote to his business partner and brother, Bob Goldwater. It says, quote, You'll probably think me seven kinds of a dirty bastard when you hear that I'm running for city councilman. He adds, You can't criticize government if you refuse to get involved. There have always been Goldwater's damned fool enough to get into politics. And he closed with this plea and promise, quote, Don't cuss me too much, he said. It ain't for life. Little did he know. While on the city council, it was Goldwater and Rosenzweig who won the fight to prohibit racial segregation at the new municipal airport. Through such efforts in 1950, Phoenix won an All-American City Award from the National Municipal League. From before statehood, Arizona had been a bastion of the Democratic Party. By 1950, there hadn't been a Republican elected to major state office in 20 years. In some areas, Democrats held a 10 to 1 advantage. But some new residents were bringing their Republicanism with them. In the governor's race that year, the GOP hoped to run Howard Pyle, a popular radio commentator and recent war correspondent. Pyle agreed to run on one condition. He said he wouldn't run unless I ran the campaign. I didn't know anything about running a campaign. So got my airplane and we traveled around the state and I introduced him to people. It was an uphill fight as Pyle crisscrossed the state in Goldwater's plane. His opponent was Anna Frohmiller, the popular state auditor. I didn't think he could beat her about two weeks before and then I thought he would and he did. Barry's efforts helped bring about a slim 3,000 vote margin to get Howard Pyle the governor's chair. In the process, Goldwater got the political bug. Ernest W. McFarland of Arizona was serving his 12th year in the United States Senate, where he was the majority leader. For a political newcomer, Barry Goldwater, to challenge such a figure was described by political observers as a 20 to 1 shot. Young, courageous, dedicated, on every issue we know where he stands. He's the man to meet the test, a great champion from the West, Barry Goldwater, Arizona's best. Young, courageous, dedicated, you know where Barry Goldwater's... A little crazy, maybe. Did you it think, was crazy. Did you think you... Did you set out thinking you would win? No, I didn't. I didn't think I had a chance. He recruited as his campaign manager, Steve Shattig, an experienced political strategist who would later manage most of Goldwater's re-election efforts. Much was made of McFarland's close ties to President Truman, whose popularity at the time was at a low point. McFarland claimed to be one of the foremost powerful men in Washington. Goldwater asked if Mac would therefore accept 25% of the blame for some recent scandals and for Truman's no-win policy in the Korean War. Beyond such debating points, Goldwater's basic speech was a forerunner of the message he'd carry for the next 35 years. We need a continuously balanced budget. We need to reduce the national debt, to reduce expenditures, and then to reduce taxes. Something for nothing is a beguiling promise. But you and I know the truth is that we never get something for nothing. The national government can't make anyone prosperous. It can only take away from your pay envelopes dollars you should be spending yourselves. Here was a young, good-looking, articulate man that was ready and that could win. And, and McFarlane uh, was not the most articulate individual in the world, uh, was, a, was a good politician in some other ways, but there was some critical gifts that he lacked at that time. Of course, the most important factor was the immense popularity 
of Republican presidential candidate Dwight David Eisenhower. Ike won by a landslide, carrying Democratic Arizona in the process. Even so, McFarland might have bucked the trend, except in Goldwater's opinion, for one factor. McFarland didn't come back to run. He just thought he had it in the bag. And I don't think he was out here but once or twice. So a couple of weeks before the election, I began picking up all the bets I could find and that you'd upset did all right. Barry Goldwater won by 7,000 votes. On January 3rd, 1953, with wife Peggy and mother Josephine watching from the Senate gallery, he was administered the oath of office from retiring Vice President Albin Barkley. It was just a few months more than 100 years after his immigrant grandfather, Big Mike Goldwater, had set foot in America. I, w I once asked General LeMay, I said, why do you want me to keep on flying these jets? I won't tell you the exact term he used, but he said, when we go to these schools and we can point and say, well, if that old, you know what can fly and you kids can fly. <laughs> a strong relationship to the state in which he served as senator. A strong relationship, a historical relationship. And that, I think, was tremendously beneficial to him. He became synonymous with Arizona, and Arizona became synonymous with Goldwater. Now those who seek absolute power, even though they seek it to do what they regard as good, are simply demanding the right to enforce their own version of heaven on earth. They... And let me remind you, they are the very ones who always create the most hellish tyrannies. President Eisenhower said to me, he says, your brother stands out in that Senate like a thoroughbred amongst a bunch of balder pates, whatever that meant, but I, I do remember it. And I was quite proud of him, and still am. And once that agency is created, there's no way to get rid of it without the Congress saying, we don't need you anymore. And you're not going to find a Congress with the guts to do that. That each man has an individual conscience to serve and a moral code to uphold, and that each man is a brother to every other man on this earth. Nobody, especially not Barry Goldwater, had any idea of the impact the new junior senator from Arizona would come to have. Typical of a new legislator, his early years were spent addressing home issues. Uh, first of all, the South Gila bill, as we call it, uh, passed both houses and was signed into law by the president last week. I'm going to be out in Arizona again uh, on the 15th and 16th and 17th to attend my youngest daughter Peggy's graduation. And learning the down and dirty side of Washington, D.C. I think we're now in our fifth straight day of rain with no signs of, uh, of letting up. He also frequently expressed concerns for America's security. Now we know that communist Russia hopes to dominate the world. We know that to protect our freedom, we must be militarily strong. But it was his appointment to a special labor committee investigating corruption and violence in certain unions that brought him to national attention. Goldwater clashed with union leaders Jimmy Hoffa and Dave Beck, and with United Auto Workers Chief Walter Ruther, who reportedly referred to the Arizona senator as a fanatic and deemed him organized labor's public enemy number one. An equally fervent Goldwater position was opposition to mandatory union membership, known as the closed shop. I say men should be free to join a labor union anytime they want to. But I also say they should not be forced to join a labor union in order to hold a job and earn a living for their families. Now, because I fought against the racketeers in union and against corruption and against the misuse of union funds, the bosses call me anti-labor. They tell you Barry Goldwater is against the unions. I'm not against the unions, but I am against graft and corruption and compulsion. I'm against violence, 
and I shall continue to fight for the rights of the individual working man. Barry Goldwater was becoming a national figure, a phenomenon that was bolstered in 1956 when he was asked to chair the Senate Republicans' campaign committee. The job involved traveling the country, speaking in hundreds of cities on behalf of Republican candidates. A politician with national ambitions would covet such an opportunity for exposure. Goldwater did not. What I was doing, I was doing because it was natural to my way of thinking. And uh, if, if that was going to get me into the position of leadership, it never entered my mind. I just figured it was something that I did because I believed in it. And I did, and I still do. What did come from the extensive speaking schedule was the opportunity to formulate, to fine tune, what would become known as Goldwater Republicanism. We know that this system, which in, in simpler terms is called socialism, has never worked in the history of the earth and is, is not working today in countries where it's been tried. If he was well received by most Republican audiences, he was sometimes misunderstood by the press. And when you talk to those men who were reporters, and you say, how could you interpret what I said as meaning this? And they say, you know, when we came to Washington, Franklin Roosevelt was the only one we knew, and he was a liberal. So we've never run into a conservative before, and we don't know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> To prevent war in our time is to make sure that communism knows that it cannot win a war if it starts one. By the mid to late 50s, between a third and a half of the world's population was ruled by communism. Under that system, there is no freedom of speech, press, or religion, no private business nor property, no free elections. The party controls everything. We will bury you, boasted Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev. And indeed, to many, communism looked like a steamroller, a repressive steamroller that couldn't be stopped. As for Senator Barry Goldwater, his consistent message was that it fell to the Americans to at least try. Now this, ladies and gentlemen, is the essence of the choice we face. It is the essence of a choice the whole world faces, but which only America only our country can put into effective action. The choice, tyranny or freedom, expediency or principle. In the meantime, the battles over union reforms continued, with Goldwater completely alienating one of the most politically potent lobbies in America. And as he returned to the Grand Canyon State to stand for re-election in 1958, the pundits in Washington said goodbye with great confidence that Barry Goldwater would not be back. During the six years since 1952, Ernest McFarlane had twice been elected governor of Arizona and was ready for a rematch. The general outlook was for a close race. President Eisenhower was still popular, but the economy was in recession. For Republicans, there would be no coattails to ride. But in those happy days of the mid to late 50s, not everything had political meaning. Rock and roll was Dick Clark and American Bandstand. The drug scene was still several years away. Americans had not yet heard of Lee Harvey Oswald, nor terrorism, nor Vietnam. America had not yet lost her innocence. And in the Goldwater family, the children were growing up. Daughter Joanne would marry a young medical student and start a family. Barry Jr. would sail a yacht from California to Hawaii and become a student at Arizona State University. Young Peggy would become a teenager. And son Michael, like his brother and father before him, would graduate from Stanton Military Academy with plans to move on to the University of Arizona. Barry and Peggy also made a move to their new home Binunakin, a Navajo word for house on the hill, just outside of Phoenix in Paradise Valley. 
and there was a bit of time for an occasional outing together. Young, courageous, dedicated, on every issue we know where he stands. The man to meet the test, a great champion from the West, Barry Goldwater, Arizona's best. But any real leisure would have to wait as the Goldwater-McFarland rematch began to heat up. As expected, Eastern labor leaders arrived to help organize against Goldwater through its Committee on Political Education, or COPE. Goldwater lashed out at him. COPE is the creation of power-hungry union dictators who seek to weld a band of steel around the freedoms of America. The objective of COPE is to defeat at the polls every senator and every representative who will not bow his head and accept dictation from the tyrants who have wormed their way into control of this nation's organized labor movement. And these are harsh charges. These are serious words. This is the truth. And I challenge the tyrants who are seeking to destroy the freedom of America to deny this truth. If McFarland had organized labor in his corner, Barry Goldwater had publisher Eugene Pulliam of the Arizona Republic and Phoenix Gazette in his. In non-union and sometimes even anti-union Arizona, Goldwater had the best of that particular deal. Still, Governor McFarland was a tireless campaigner with an electric smile. The Republicans were still the minority party, and a substantial effort was made to deliver positive messages. Arizona Senator Barry Goldwater, honored by General Curtis LeMay in the Air Force as the Outstanding Reserve Officer of the Year, the only qualified jet pilot in the Congress. One of the best men in public life I have ever known is Barry Goldwater. He's got the guts to say what he thinks at all times. Barry Goldwater has stood up strongly in favor of economy and efficiency in government. He is a politician who is not afraid to stand up for what he knows is right. And we in Arizona finally have a senator who is trying to help the little fellow. I shall gladly vote for his re-election. Re-elect Barry Goldwater, United States Senator. There was a rather confusing last-minute smear effort involving a handbill depicting Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin winking and urging folks to vote for Goldwater. It didn't work. When the returns were counted, Barry Goldwater was re-elected by 35,000 votes. There had been other conservative Republican leaders, Senator Robert Taft of Ohio. But Barry Goldwater had something Taft had lacked, great appeal on the stump and on the new medium called television. One of the most least pretentious of politicians I've ever known, Senator Barry Goldwater. The demand for Goldwater appearances increased. Again, he was asked to chair the Senate Republican Campaign Committee. Some more moderate to liberal Republicans might have preferred that he didn't give his speech in their hometowns, but nonetheless appreciated his ability to fill a banquet hall and raise money. But there was also increased demand for his message. With the help of Stephen Shattig, he began writing a three-time-a-week newspaper column entitled, How Do You Stand, Sir? In a matter of months, it was picked up by 50 newspapers. And then there was The Conscience of a Conservative, a book of Goldwater speeches edited by Brent Bozell of National Review magazine. The 123-page volume eventually sold 4 million copies. It was understandable that citizens might agree or disagree with Goldwater's views, but he was almost universally liked as a person and respected for his honesty and candor. I've always said what's on my mind. I've never stopped to figure <clears throat> whether it be smart politics or not. So that's where they got the idea of shooting from the hip. Didn't bother me. That's the way I lived. And that's the way I continue to live. In addition,
addition to Republican rallies, he was often invited to address business and industry organizations for which substantial speaking fees, or honoraria, were paid. All such funds went to charity. The honorarium would frequently be in the vicinity, whatever, of uh, five, ten thousand uh, dollars a lot of money. He did not keep a dime of those, that honorarium. It never even occurred to him to keep it. It was a foregone conclusion that Vice President Richard Nixon had the delegate votes for the 1960 Republican presidential nomination. Even Arizona was in the Nixon column, so when the South Carolina delegation committed to Barry, it was more a philosophical statement than a serious challenge. Conservatives were present, but not enough to be potent. At most, they hoped to have a conservative influence on the party platform. But when Nixon met secretly with New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller to write a more liberal platform, conservatives were furious. Goldwater was offered a nomination. A man with the courage of heroes, United States Senator Barry Goldwater of Arizona. The senator withdrew his name. Delegates to the convention and fellow Republicans, I respectfully ask the chairman to withdraw my name from nomination. but addressed the national audience and challenged his conservative supporters to keep working. We have lost election after election in this country in the last several years because conservative Republicans get mad and stay home. This country is too important for anyone's feeling. This country and its majesty is too great for any man, be he conservative or liberal, to stay home and not work just because he doesn't agree. Let's grow up, conservatives. Let's get to work. During the campaign, Goldwater made 125 speeches in 26 states on behalf of the Richard Nixon, Henry Cabot Lodge ticket. The Republicans lost to John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson. But the conservatives had found a new cause. Goldwater in 64. I don't think we've depended enough on a philosophical presentation, intelligent presentation of American life appealing to the decency of the American people. I may be wrong, and if I am wrong, then our days are numbered. Live TV on the, on the morning program, national. And when the interviewed her, the question, the inevitable question was asked of this dear old lady, well, Mrs. Goldwater, how does it feel to have your son, Barry, nominated as President of the United States? And she said, Barry? They should have nominated Bob. He's the smart one. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've seen Barry Goldwater now become a nationally famous politician. Uh, John Shattig, your father, Steve Shattig, was Barry's campaign manager through uh, most of those races for the Senate and such. Uh, what are your Well, they were great friends. They shared lots of things in common. Uh, both were photographers, both were pilots, uh, and I think, of course, they shared a philosophy that they believed in. You know, a lot of people remember Barry for his candor and his directness, uh, for his strength and his courage, but uh, I think it's important to remember his humor as well. Uh, watching this, I remember the 52 campaign was famous for having used Burma shave signs. That's right. Uh, and and I, I don't know how people today even to remember that. You need to explain the viewers what a Burma yeah. shave sign Burma is. Burma shave sign were a series of signs that would be placed upon the road, and there would be four in a row, and then finally the last one would s send the selling message. In this case, it was Mac is for Harry, Harry's all through, Harry Truman, you be for Barry, because Barry's for you. And then the last sign would be Goldwater for Senate. And uh, years later, uh, when I decided to run for Congress, um, I had to give Barry a ride uh, one, t one day, and we were talking about the campaign, and things didn't look good at the moment, and I said, well, Barry, I always just wanted to run for office so I could use Burma shape signs. <laughs> and there was a long pause, and he said one word, funny. And I waited, and, and he said, John, they've got to be funny. And his <laughs> whole point was, don't do Burma shape signs if you don't make them funny. Uh, so yeah. he was a great prankster. Paul Shat, you've... Uh 
you know, your association with Senator Goldwater was was mostly political. You know, I, I'm sure. Where, you know, what do you where do you see him as a, as an effective politician? My goodness, you know, I I think one. I mean, uh, you know, looking at his at his life, uh, you see that he was uh, larger than life in so many different areas, but in politics, there again, just just as he did in business and in photography and um, aviation. Uh, in politics, he personified the rise of the West. And in fact, one of the reasons why uh, he came as a surprise to the Eastern Wing of the Republican Party when he got the nomination was was they weren't used to seeing political power shift to the West. And so you could read a lot of Eastern newspapers in 1964 and believe that he really wasn't going to win. Uh, and I think that uh, you know it was that post-war expansion of the West, Arizona particularly, um, that uh, Barry personified. Governor Hall, now I've heard it said, or maybe I've heard you say it, that you and your husband Terry decided to move to Arizona many years ago because this is where Barry Goldwater was from. Now is there truth to that or what's the story? We sat in an auditorium at KU Medical Center and uh, listened to Barry Goldwater probably in 61 and were just unbelievably impressed because he said the things that we had always so strongly believed. 62, my husband came out here for uh, with the public health. I taught school, and we never went back to Kansas. And my first uh, political experience was uh, handing out a few leaflets for Barry Goldwater in 1964. Is that right? You and Hillary Clinton? Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I did the same thing. And that's what I remember about his early, uh, early politics was as a young kid going and hammering the signs up on the to telephone poles and handing out uh, campaign literature. Uh, the whole family was involved in those campaigns. Uh, mm -hmm. We'd travel with mom or dad or we, my, or my brother and I would go all over the state of Arizona by ourselves when we, when we were allowed to drive. Um, but those were fun times. And I remember John's dad real well. Uh, he was almost part of our family because they, he was there strategizing and working working with my dad. But I can remember Steve. all of your dad's visits to my house. Yeah. Uh, many times he'd come over and, and uh, they'd uh, get to yucking it up and telling stories and having a good time and he was uh, quite a figure. Well your dad was uh, a, a really significant influence on my father. I mean a lot of his thinking and ideas and posturing uh, was came right out of your dad's head. He was a, he was a real savvy politician and human being. You know I was uh, I was a kid well, gosh, let's be honest. In 1952, when Barry Goldwater went to the Senate, I think I was in the second grade. So my whole life had Barry Goldwater as, you know, as a, as a, as a figure. And over the years, as I would see him, and, and especially as the presidential movement started happening, there were two things that always struck me. Is, uh, one, he was this tremendous extemporaneous speaker um, and eloquent, eloquent. You know, not a lot of formal education, as I think Butch Ruffner pointed out in the in the video, but just eloquent, and he had a charisma that uh, I don't know. You know, there was just an air of excitement about Barry Goldwater when you were around him or when you were watching him, you know, on film. Uh, Bob, was he always that way, or was that a function of politics? All of the, all of Barry's. Most of Barry's speeches were extemporaneous, and the uh, the ones that were were much better than any that somebody ever wrote for him. You probably remember the speech that Ronald Reagan made at the end of his '64 campaign. They someone wrote a beautiful speech and gave it to Barry to give, and. Barry said, Ronald Reagan can give this much better than I can. So let's give it to him, because Barry didn't like to read speeches. And that speech made Ronnie. Mm -hmm. yeah, that speech was entitled A Time for Choosing, and it really was yeah. the beginning of the Reagan Revolution. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, now, Barry, you served in the US Congress for, for a number of years from, from California. Um, were you, it sounds like a dumb question, were you in your father's shadow or were people always expecting, you know, you to be just like him and did that ever cause you concerns? Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, I was judged by that standard. And 
of course, it was because of his involvement in politics that I wound up in politics, not because he had he told me to do it or asked me to. In fact, he didn't even know I was thinking about it. And when he did find out that I was going to run, I told him to stay home and just send money. <laughs> because I got into politics because because my name was Goldwater. People kind of asked me to, to appear and to do things. I was busy as a stockbroker trying to make some money. But uh, I was involved in politics. And then when there was a vacancy in my congressional district, uh, a bunch of my friends said, you run and we'll run the campaign. And that's how I got to Congress. Um, I spent 14 there, years th there with him. But to be honest with you, I never saw him very much. Um, He's on the other side of the Capitol. We only, did, right. we only had one piece of legislation in those 14 years that we both worked on. Or actually two. One was the gold medal to John Wayne. And the second one was the Privacy Act of 1974. And he and I both introduced an amendment to uh, prohibit the use of the Social Security number unless authorized by Congress. Uh, it passed the Senate and the House almost at the same time, and it was signed into law. A year or so later, it was nullified because the Congress decided to authorize it. I want to jump in the moment or so we have left to, to, to Paul Shatt. You know, again, being here in Arizona as he was rising in prominence and as people started talking about Goldwater for president, there was a, uh, what word, a phenomenon. There was just, it, the, it took on a life of itself. There was just this whole atmosphere about Barry Goldwater in this, this charismatic way. You were a reporter. You covered that. You know, just comment on that. Do you, do you remember that? Oh, ex extremely so. I mean, and, and I remember that uh, uh, it got so that uh, you would expect that the Republic's weather uh, story would, would quote the office of Senator Goldwater <laughs> because uh, he was a, such a source of news because uh, anything Barry did or said was, was going to be gigantic news. And the force of his personality and coupled with the fact that his message really had found a time where it had come. Uh, those two together, I mean, it was dynamite. He was as big in Arizona, I think, as Charles de Gaulle in France. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Well, as we go back to the program, we uh, will see the, the presidential race, we'll see how that turned out uh, in the later part of his life. So let's return now to Barry Goldwater and American Life. We don't gain anything when you disagree with the platform and then do not go out and work and vote for your party. I know what you say. You say, I'll get even with that fellow. I'll show this party something. But what are you doing when you stay at home? In a very real sense, the fact that Barry Goldwater would be the Republican candidate in 1964 was decided when he addressed the convention in 1960. Let's grow up, conservatives. Let's get to work. His call was to promote a point of view. What lay ahead was a contest. The Eastern Republicans, typified by Nelson Rockefeller, tied to big business, and the Ivy League had considerable resources. The Western and Southern Republicans, the Goldwater people, tied to small business, in essence a populist movement, had nothing to lose. Barry Goldwater's admirers determined that they would elect him president of the United States, but it was early. Meanwhile, the nation found itself engrossed in a new pastime, watching the glamorous activities of Jack and Jackie and listening to the eloquence of the new frontier. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. The senator from Arizona was not being ignored. In 1961, virtually every magazine had him on the cover. Even popular mechanics featured his interest in electronics. And he maintained a busy speaking schedule. But to the frustration of friends, however, he would not even discuss presidential politics. Finally, in December 1962, a group of supporters took independent action holding a strategy session in Chicago. The result was creation of the Draft Goldwater Committee to be chaired by Texan Peter O'Donnell and operated by New Yorker F. Clifton White. 
The plan was simple, build a nationwide grassroots organization of Goldwater supporters who would become delegates to the 1964 convention. Cliff White was a master organizer, lining up delegates in 40 states. But the senator continued to say he wasn't interested. In June of 1963, he indicated he'd be running for re-election and asked his longtime friend, Phoenix attorney Dennison Kitchell, to open a campaign office. It did seem odd, however, that the office was located not in Arizona, but in Washington. Kitchell began to monitor the draft committee's activity and success. Across the country, local chapters popped up. Momentum and pressure were building. On July 4th, the senator was in Arizona, but the committee held a draft Goldwater rally in Washington. 6,000 people showed up. It would appear that such public demonstrations were making the Eastern Republican establishment nervous. On July 14th, Governor Rockefeller made a speech to the effect that Goldwater was the dupe of a lunatic right-wing fringe that used Nazi methods. If the speech had any impact, it was to make Barry lean toward running. Ironically, one of the people he discussed the idea with was his friend, President John F. Kennedy. Oh, it would have been probably, I can say this, the most educational campaign this country's ever had. Because we had pretty much semi agreed to debates. That is, we he'd go to Omaha and I'd be with him. We might have even rented the same airplane. And he might get up first and expound his ideas, and then I would try to tear them down. And in the next town I would do the same we'd do the same thing with me. He made no announcement, but a strategy was developed and campaign oriented activity increased. Not only is President Kennedy cognizant of the possibilities that Senator Goldwater will be the Republican candidate, but recent surveys, one as late as of today, indicate that he is at this moment the front runner. On September 17, a rally was held in Dodger Stadium, Los Angeles. 40,000 people attended. Goldwater's enthusiasm was coming alive. But it died in Dallas on Friday, November 22nd, 1963. And it was very hard for me to believe. And I just immediately thought, well, there goes the presidential campaign, because I'm not about to run against Lyndon Johnson. But not one to mince words in his autobiography, Goldwater writes. Johnson was a dirty fighter, innuendo and lies, treacherous. He'd slap you on the back today and stab you in the back tomorrow. The man didn't believe half of what he said. He was a hypocrite. And Barry adds, for good measure, LBJ made me sick, end quote. The Goldwater in 64 movement had gained great momentum. It had become perhaps the first and only populist presidential draft in American political history. I didn't want to run for president. I tried to discourage people from putting my name in. But I don't know, that those thoughts never entered my mind. I just figured if that's what the Lord wanted me to do, I'd go on out and do it. First. I want to tell you that I will seek the Republican presidential nomination. And I have decided to do this because of the principles in which I believe, and because I'm convinced that millions of Americans share my belief in those principles. puts the flying time to good use. Keeping up with national affairs. Brother, was it cold in February. But a touch of cold can't stop a campaign. And he spoke out on foreign policy, social security, communism, foreign aid, the United Nations, Cuba. He told the people only a strong America can guarantee freedom. 
He said appeasement and accommodation cannot assure peace. He called for personal responsibility in government at the local level because Barry Goldwater wants to give the government back to the people. One could say the New Hampshire primary was a shakedown cruise. The good news was that he outpolled rival Nelson Rockefeller. The bad news was that he lost to write-in candidate Henry Cabot Lodge. The Goldwater managers, Kitchell, Dean Birch, and Dick Kleindienst, feared the campaign might grind to a halt. In reality, it had the opposite effect. Years later, Arizona Congressman John Rhodes would say it was the New Hampshire defeat that got Barry's dander up and made him determined to win the nomination. Over the next few months, the campaign enjoyed numerous successes, especially at state conventions. By mid-May, Goldwater had more than 500 of the 655 delegates needed. The June 2nd California primary could wrap it up, but it was there that Nelson Rockefeller made his stand. The New York governor had been politically damaged by his recent divorce and remarriage, but he was ahead in the polls and would spend an unheard of three and a half million dollars to stay there. But the conservative grassroots proved more valuable. An emergency appeal in the last two weeks raised a half million dollars for the Arizonans' final television blitz. With more than two million people going to the polls, Barry Goldwater won by 59,000 votes. The nomination was virtually assured for the conservative leader, but the Eastern Republican establishment made a last-ditch effort with the candidacy of Governor William Scranton of Pennsylvania. At the convention, the Arizona group wasn't particularly worried. Personally, Barry liked Bill Scranton and had considered him as a possible vice presidential candidate. Then the Scranton people, reportedly without the governor's approval, issued a letter which in effect called Goldwater a nuclear warmonger and a racist. It caused a considerable stir which would not affect the convention vote, but perhaps set the tone for the election itself. South Carolina cares 16 votes for Senator Barry Goldwater. The acceptance speech was vintage Goldwater. Communism and the government it now controls are enemies of every man on earth who is or wants to be free. And an appeal for unity. We must not see malice in honest differences of opinion, and no matter how great, so long as they are not inconsistent with the pledges we have given to each other in and through our Constitution. Most remembered for paraphrasing a statement made 2,000 years earlier by Cicero. I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. Decades later, historians would agree that the quote might have sounded urbane and inspirational had it been said by a John F. Kennedy. From Goldwater, at that time and place, it was interpreted as an endorsement of reactionary groups and extremist tactics. As his vice presidential candidate, Goldwater chose Congressman William E. Miller, a conservative from upstate New York, who was the Republican national chairman. Possessed of a biting sense of humor, some joked that Miller was chosen because Lyndon Johnson found him so irritating. In reality, the election was over as the campaign began. There was great sympathy for the memory of John F. Kennedy. And as Goldwater said, the people weren't likely to want three different presidents in a period of one year. The campaign's opinion research studies told him that. And it showed further that no Republican could probably get more than 20% of the vote against Johnson. So we knew full well during the campaign that uh, we had no way of beating Johnson. Well, I wouldn't be in this thing if I thought I was going to lose because, as I said, I'm, uh, I'm too old to go back to work and I'm too young to get out of politics. If in his mind he knew he couldn't win, 
In his heart, Barry Goldwater hoped at least to have America consider his message. If Goldwater had any later regrets, it might have been that seldom did his message get past the media. For example, in an interview with ABC's Howard K. Smith, the senator said that our military had the capability but would not ever use nuclear devices to defoliate the Vietnam jungles. The wire services reported that Goldwater favored dropping nuclear bombs on Vietnam. And then there was the issue of social security. A conservative is not foolish enough to think that you're going to throw out every so-called social gain that we've made. I think there are many programs that we can improve until the public itself clamors for the removal. Take social security. You're not going to do away with that. But why not make it flexible? And I have never at any time advocating doing away with Social Security. When he expressed concern about the fiscal soundness of the Social Security Fund, the Concord, New Hampshire Monitor's headline read, quote, Goldwater sets goal, end Social Security, end quote. Later, LBJ's television commercials would depict Goldwater tearing up an elderly person's Social Security card. With your very strong uh, integrationist record in the past, uh, uh, former NAACP and Urban League and so forth, and your own record in your stores. Uh, We've mentioned Goldwater's integration of the National Guard and the Phoenix Airport. He had also given financial support in the court fight to integrate Arizona's schools in 1953. In the Senate, he had voted for civil rights laws in 1957, 60, and 63. In addition, he had offered amendments outlawing racial discrimination in unions. Organized labor succeeded in killing the proposals. I'll leave it up to the American people. I think in the long run, uh, they're going to realize that discrimination in any form is wrong. When the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was presented, Goldwater agreed with all but two provisions. One in particular would apply the Equal Accommodations Law to a homeowner offering a spare bedroom for rent. It was called the Mrs. Murphy Law. To Goldwater, the provision, though well-intentioned, was unconstitutional, a clash between the guarantee of liberty and the goal of equality. Some political supporters hoped that, for the sake of the presidential campaign, he would bend his principles and vote yes. He would not. Addressing the Senate, he said, quote, if my vote is misconstrued, let it be and let me suffer the consequences." End quote. Even some liberal scholars, while disagreeing, called Goldwater's arguments well-reasoned and courageous. In the campaign, however, he was called a racist and a segregationist. Perhaps the most outrageous story, coming from Daniel Shore of CBS, was that Goldwater planned to fly to Germany to address a convention of neo-Nazis. Well, I got so damn mad about that, I told the television people that every, every network could come to interview me except CBS. Well, naturally, I got a call from CBS. And they want to know what the trouble I said, the trouble is, Dan Shore has told a goddamn lie, and if you want to get back in my room, you get him to retract it or you retract it. Well, at first, they weren't going to do it. But when they found out I meant business, uh, they got short or retracted, and said, made a misstatement and misunderstood and so forth. So we got over that one. But certainly the most devastating assault came from the Lyndon Johnson campaign. The earlier report that Goldwater favored using nuclear weapons in Vietnam could never be fully dispelled. Using that foundation of fear, Johnson campaign operative Bill Moyer, later a television commentator, approved and broadcast this now infamous commercial. These are the stakes. Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. I don't look on Bill Moyer as the most honest man that ever came down the road. He preaches a pretty good gospel. But back in those days, he didn't act it. The final tally was approximately 43 million votes for Johnson, 27 million for Goldwater. 
Some would later observe that given the nature of the campaign and the news reports, it was amazing that the senator from Arizona polled 38.5% of the vote. For Barry Goldwater, the role of private citizen was still in the public eye. Fabulous. You look great. He said you've been spending a lot of time up there, and the relaxation must, must suit you well. Well, I, this being unemployed has its advantages. <laughs> the department store chain had been sold, leaving the Goldwaters fairly comfortable, and with time for family outings. Here, rafting the treacherous Salmon River of Idaho. New, more technologically modern adventures on the Colorado. Making public service appearances with the grandchildren on local television. Okay. Uh, when you threw your cans, don't just throw them away on the desert. We call those people litter bugs, and we don't want to dirty up the desert. So here's a nice green can up here. Barry Goldwater's Arizona and making national appearances, in this case on CBS, which Barry apparently had forgiven for the run-ins during the campaign. There was time for flying. And time with Peggy. But several thousand miles away, one of Goldwater's earlier warnings was coming true. Don't try to sweep this under the rug. We are at war in Vietnam. And yet the president, who is the commander-in-chief of our forces, refuses to say, refuses to say, mind you, whether or not the objective over there is victory. And his secretary of defense continues to mislead and misinform the American people, and enough of it's gone by. If that Persian War, Gulf War, taught us anything, it was when you go to war, go to war with the idea that you're going to end it in the next hour, and let the military people run it. Not one to sit at home, he went on several occasions between 1965 and 69 to Vietnam. There, the two-star reserve general, probably without Pentagon approval, flew numerous reconnaissance missions over North Vietnam to learn firsthand of enemy tactics and troop movements. Goldwater remains bitter over the handling of both the Korean and Vietnam Wars, which combined cost more than 100,000 American lives. We lost the war in Korea and the war in Vietnam for one simple reason. The politicians tried to run the war, and they didn't know their ass from a hot rock about running a war. He saves his strongest criticism for Kennedy and Johnson Defense Secretary Robert McNamara. For McNamara. Probably did more damage to uh, the United States' ability to wage war did more damage to our armed forces than any single man in the history of the United States. He was a total disaster. In his own way, McNamara returned the fire. In 1967, when Goldwater retired from the Air Force after 37 years of service, the defense secretary refused to allow a banquet to be held at Luke Air Base outside of Phoenix. When the ceremony was held instead at the Arizona Air National Guard facility, Goldwater's speech to the crowd included the promise, quote, if that bastard thinks he's through with me, he's mistaken, end quote. Goldwater was anything but through, though. It was a foregone conclusion that he would run and be returned to the Senate in 1968. Those canyons and valleys camped on her wind-chilled mesas. He's found a great message in this raw-boned land. From tombstone to Sedona, the words ring strong and true. Self-reliance, hard work, rugged, determined stick-togetherness. 
the lessons of a great state that still remembers its fierce struggle for survival. Arizona's lesson is America's lesson, but much of America has forgotten. That's why Barry Goldwater must be returned to the U.S. Senate. From Tombstone to Chicago, from Sedona to Detroit, Arizona's strong, true words are needed now more than ever before. Senator Barry Goldwater. Doesn't that sound great? He would be re-elected again in 1974 and 1980. What time is that tomorrow morning? Yeah. As early as you can come. You know, I'd rather be here tomorrow morning, have lunch in Phoenix, and be back here tomorrow night. Yeah. No. <laughs> Why don't you send it up? <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> Returning for another 18 years in the U.S. Senate, Barry Goldwater was often viewed as a national asset and was sometimes in a unique position. When America was gripped by the Watergate scandal, it was his credibility and candor that allowed him to play a pivotal role in convincing Richard Nixon to resign and prevent a constitutional crisis. But if one were to ask the senator his own opinion, he'd say his most important legislative contribution was the 1986 reorganization of the Defense Department, the Goldwater Nunn Act, named for the Arizonan and Senator Sam Nunn of Georgia. At the end of his fifth term in the United States Senate, Barry Goldwater would have just turned 78 years of age. Peggy had passed away a year earlier in December of 1985. There would be no more campaigns. It was time to go home. But before he headed back to his house on the hill, there would be honors and testimonials. The Congress would create a scholarship fund in his name in the field of science and technology. The Department of Defense would award him its medal for distinguished public service. Later, there would be a high school named in his honor and streets, and an airport. And of course, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Hailed as a prophet before his time, selfless in the service of his nation, Barry Goldwater has earned the unbounded affection and admiration of his countrymen and the enduring gratitude of all future generations of America. And here you go, Mr. Conservative. But perhaps the tribute that meant the most, that was most apt, was presented on the plain of West Point, the United States Military Academy, where he had wanted to be some 60 years earlier. The Sylvanius Thayer Award honors an American citizen whose service and accomplishments in the national interest exemplify personal devotion to the ideals of the West Point motto, duty, honor, country. And who more appropriate than a man who viewed sacrifice and service as a personal duty? And I just want to help pay for our rent, so to speak, on this land. A man who was respected by supporters and adversaries alike as having the courage of his convictions, even if misunderstood, even if condemned. Moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. And who, above all earthly and personal interests, devoted his life to the ideals embodied in the Constitution of his nation. Duty, honor, country. I'm most glad about being born and having two wonderful parents and having been born in the United States and in Arizona. I don't know how the hell you can beat that. I want to be remembered uh, as an honest man who tried. That's about all you can ask for. From the Arizona Territory to the hearts of America's people, Barry Goldwater, an American life. The colors of the rainbow, so pretty in the sky so on the faces of people going by I see friends shaking hands saying how do you do they're really saying 
What a wonderful world And I think to myself What a wonderful Barry Goldwater and American Life. The friends and family joined here will take the last four or five minutes or so and just get your, your closing comments, your, your final thoughts on the life of Barry Goldwater. And let's start appropriately with, with his brother, Bob Goldwater. Well, one of Barry's main wishes was that when he died, people would remember him as a honest man. I think he's going to get that wish. I think it's very apparent in all of his activities and the moves he made that he was honest. He was an honest man. God bless him. Barry Goldwater, Jr., remember your father. Well, when my stepmother called me, 7, 7.30 in the morning, I told him when my father had passed away. I cried hard. And I guess without tears, there's no rainbow. And I remember my father's life as a rainbow full of beautiful experiences and, and, and things that we did as a family. He was a tough father, though. He was a tough father. He, was, he would never come and dig you out of a hole. You had to dig yourself out. He gave us a philosophy to live by, and he showed us what that philosophy was all about by the way he lived his life. So I remember it was um, one unusual great father. Governor Jane Hall. The honesty, the candor. And I think what we've seen today, the love of his family, that uh, doesn't always comes through, but not as much as it did with this. Barry Goldwater loved people, and I think you could not see him without understanding that what he did, he did because he cared about the people of Arizona and the people of this country. Paul Shatt. No man has meant more to Arizona than Barry Goldwater, and that should be a legacy that uh, uh, we would all envy, but his legacy is much larger than that. You know, in the presidential campaign, he said it would be a war of ideas, not a campaign of, of personalities, and he lost the race for president, but he won the war of ideas. His ideas have prevailed. Uh, his attitude towards limited government, towards slowing the race of the welfare state. So all Americans are indebted to Barry Goldwater, but most of all Arizonans. John Shattig. Tremendous influence on my life, uh, his love of Arizona, mostly his kindness and his generosity to all the people he knew. Um, but as Paul said, he changed America. He started a revolution, and he changed America for the better. Um, I think it's wonderful that people may get to know Senator Goldwater uh, through uh, his passing. Millions of Americans who perhaps didn't know him before and didn't know the wonderful sides of him uh, that are there, the human side. To all of you, thank you for being with us, and now it's my turn. In America today, the prevailing attitude toward politics is often cynicism. But an examination of the life and career of Barry Goldwater serves to remind us, to reassure us, that there will always be a place of honor for an honorable person. In political life, words are the coin of the realm, and let's face it, sometimes political words aren't worth a lot. But Barry's words were. 
They were straightforward. They were indeed colorful. They were from the heart. And what words did people use about him? What did his adversaries say? They said, I may not agree with him, but by God, I respect him. He's honest. He has the courage of his convictions. In recent years, some old friends have said, well, Barry's changed his views. He got liberal on us. Well, the best way to answer that charge is with a direct quote from the senator, something we just heard him say in the film. Quote, they don't know their ass from a hot rock. <laughs> Goldwater's conservatism always had, had its roots in libertarianism. The personal liberty of the individual to make his or her own choices, whether the issue was joining a labor union in the 50s or gay rights in the 90s, the principle to Barry Goldwater was the same, personal liberty. Barry Goldwater did not test public opinion to form his views. He did not test public opinion then change his views. What you saw, what you heard, was what you got. He was the real thing. And we can hope that his example will inspire a new generation of leaders to resolve to meet that standard. America would certainly be a better place for it. Barry Goldwater, there will never be another quite like him. I'm Bill McCune. Take care. Yeah.